Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I can't hear you. I said, Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. All right, so up as we pray together. I want you to commit yourself to the Lord that God will make you a matured adult believer. That the entrance of the Word of God will bring light, knowledge, grace, strength, vision, desire to serve the Lord into your heart. That in the real sense, in the scriptural sense, you'll be hungry, you'll be thirsty, for whatever the Lord has for you. That you will not be a spectator, an observer. In the Bible study today, but you will be a partaker, a participant, a possessor of the blessing of God. In Jesus' name we pray. Yeah. Heavenly Father, we thank you for our Bible study. We thank you because you are always with us. And you teach us and give us your revelation. And we pray today again, O oh Lord, over here and in all the locations where we are, that you grant us a real revelation of your word in Jesus' name. Amen. And we pray, Lord, that as the word comes in, strength, grace, power to be obedient to your word, you grant to everyone. Amen. Bless everyone at the Bible study today. Amen. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. You can be seated. I welcome every one of you to the Bible study. The people who are here in front of me. And all those people in various locations where we're having the Bible study now. And I know we're not only having the Bible study in church locations. I've come to know. There are some special places where we have the satellite. And as we are gathered there tonight, and you are hearing the Bible study, as we study together, I pray that as the Lord is blessing us here, He'll bless you over there in Jesus' name. Amen. And I want to really appreciate my time with you. Those of you listening to me now in FCT. Abuja, where the Bible study came from last Monday. I'm sure you are hearing more testimonies that are coming in, even though I'm at the headquarters in Lagos here. The testimonies are flowing here to you. I don't have time tonight to share with the people who are, who are before me, but great, great things are happening. And whole communities are coming to the Lord. And we glorify the name of the Lord. And for those who are expecting me this week, I don't want to mention your location. Otherwise, I have a lot of people running away from uh, the leadership meeting we have tomorrow. And then they'll be running there. But my heart is with you. I'm really praying that God will give us a breakthrough. As we have a wonderful time with you this week. Now at the Bible study today. We're looking at Matthew chapter 5. Please open your Bible with me. Matthew chapter 5. I'm reading from verse 1. And seeing the multitudes... He went up into a mountain, and when he was set, when he sat down, his disciples came unto him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth, and now verse 6, blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. You will notice that Jesus Christ taught his own disciples, and he taught the multitudes. 
Why did he do that? One, he saw the people in their ignorance. Two, he saw them in their need for revelation. And therefore, he came to them knowing their need so that they'll be able to have what they lack. Number one, they lack knowledge. Number two, they lack understanding. Number three, they lack strength. Number four, they lack energy. That is the energy of the spirit. But eat number five, they lack the power for life, to live the life of the kingdom. And then number six, they also lack the sustaining grace to be able to live the kingdom life. And so he taught them. If you look at verse 2, it says in verse 2, And he opened his mouth and taught them. The question I have for you is this, Why did he teach them? And why is he teaching us? Look at Mark chapter 6. In Mark chapter 6, verse 34. Mark chapter 6, verse 34. It says, and Jesus when he came out some much people and was moved with compassion toward them because they were a sheep not having a shepherd and he began to teach them many things they were sheep without a shepherd without a leader without a teacher without a light bearer, without somebody to show them the way. And therefore, he opened his mouth and he taught them. He's teaching us today, number one, so that we can be transformed. If you come to the Bible study and you say that you have heard the Bible study, you've learned with us, and something has not happened to you on the inside, happening to your attitude, happening to your character, happening to your comportment, happening to your actions in life. You have not been at the Bible study. And you know you can be somewhere with your body and you are not there with your mind, with your spirit, with your soul, with your totality, with your personality. If you are really there at the Bible study, the reason why the Lord is teaching us, number one, is to transform us, to be transformed. In Romans chapter 12, I'm looking at verse 2. And be not conformed to this world, and that's what the teaching of the Bible, the teaching of the word of God, that's what it does. And that's what he did to his own disciples. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Mark it down then in your personal life. If you are really coming to the Bible study, and if you're learning from the Bible study, the first thing it does for you is that it transforms you. Number two, you are taught so you can go and tell. You are taught so you can go and tell. You see, there's no point just hearing the word of God. And you don't tell other people. You do not talk to other people about it. Every time the Lord made somebody... And that person was touched by the Lord, transformed by the Lord. He said, go and tell it. Go and tell it. And all those who were at the crusade last week, and you received the word of God, and your life was turned around, and you were transformed. He has done that for you so you can go and tell it. And those of us who are here, the Lord has spoken the word of God to you. You have been coming to the Bible study over and over and over again. He has transformed you. Number two thing, the second thing, go and tell. Mark chapter 5. In Mark chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 18. Mark 5, 18. And when he was come into the sheep, he that had been possessed with the devil prayed him beseeched him, begged him, pleaded with him, that he might be with him. How be it, Jesus suffered him not, permitted him not, but saith unto him, Go home to thy friends, and tell them, and tell them, how great things the Lord has done for thee, and has had compassion on thee. Another name for that is soul winning. Another word for that is witnessing. Another word for that is preaching. Now you have been transformed. 
as you have come to the Bible study, as you have attended the program, and the Lord is saying, here is what you have to do now. After you have been transformed, go and tell. Tell them at home. Tell your friends. Tell your neighbors. Tell your co-workers how great things the Lord has done for you. And has had compassion on you. Verse 20. And he departed and began to publish, that is to tell, in the capolis, how great things Jesus had done for him. And all men did marvel. Number three, go and testify to others. Go and testify to others. If you come to the Bible study and you're learning so much, sinking is soaking in, drinking is so much, and you're not telling others, you're not testifying to other people, you're not doing enough. As you hear, and the word of God touches you, turns you around, here is what you have to do. You go to tell other people. You go to testify to other people. We're told in Acts of the Apostles chapter 10. Acts chapter 10 verse 42 and verse 43. And he commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify. He commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify. Who are these people? Those were the disciples. They were there in Matthew chapter 5. And the Lord was teaching them. And as the Lord taught them, then he commanded them, go and tell, go and testify. I'm emphasizing this to you because you need to get up and do something. You need to evangelize. You need to win souls. Everything you are learning here, you are learning so you can go and testify to other people that it is he which was ordained of God to be the judge of the quick and the dead. That's the living and the dead in verse 43. To him give all the prophets witness that through his name whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission, removal, forgiveness of sin. That's salvation. You go and testify that Jesus is the savior. Number four, go and talk to others. May you see, I don't know how to give a testimony. I don't know how to testify. Just talk, just talk. And talk about the goodness of God. About the salvation of the Lord. About what we're learning here. Just talk about it. Bring out the outline. And see other, other people, a younger person than you are. You're a teacher, talk to your students about it. You're a student, talk to a co-student about it. You are a worker in a place, talk to all the workers about it. And go and talk to them what you have learned here. Talk about the word of God. The word and the work of God. Psalm 119 verse 27. Psalm 119 verse 27. In verse 27 it says, Make me to understand the way of thy precepts, so, so shall I talk of thy wondrous works. Make me to understand. What was Jesus doing? He was making the people to understand the word of God. You have heard it was said by them of old, this, this, and this. But now I say unto you, he made them to understand. And after you have been made to understand, what do you do after that? Go and talk about it. And if you are not doing that, you are not doing enough. You come to the Bible study, the glory, the joy. It's not that I never miss Bible study. I'm there all the time. I enjoy the Bible study. It's the delight of my heart. That's great. But you go to other people, you talk about those things that you have learned. Look at verse 27 again. It says, make me to understand the way of thy precepts. So shall I talk of thy wondrous works. Number five, go and turn others to the Lord. And you are not just telling, just to tell. You are not just testifying, just to testify. Neither are you just talking, just to talk. You have a goal, you have a purpose, and it's to turn them. Turn them. Turn them from darkness unto light. Turn them from their sin unto the Savior. Turn them from the power of Satan, the power of darkness, unto the power of God. Acts chapter 26. Acts chapter 26. I'm reading from verse 
16. But thrice and stand upon thy feet. For I have appeared unto thee for this purpose to make thee a minister and a witness both of those things which thou hast seen and of those things in the which I will appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee to open their eyes. That's what I'm going to go and do. Open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God that they may inherit among that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inherit among them and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me number six go and teach others teach others and when the lord teaches you he wants to transform you to be a teacher and everyone can be like that uh, there was a time I didn't know the Bible like I know it today. But you know, when you teach, you learn two times. You learn now. And then you teach another person. While you're teaching another person, you're learning more. A teacher is a double learner. He learns first. And because he's committed to teaching what he has learned, then he learns all over again. Hey, you wonder, how does the preacher, the pastor, the teacher, how does he remember all the verses of scriptures that he quotes? I didn't know them before, but as I had them from others, I learned that's one. And then I gave it to other people. Because I gave it to other people, I repeated it to other people. I learned more. And so I remember, if you want to be remembering the word of God, teach other people. Take the outline in your hand and go line upon line, precept on precept, teach other people. And when you do that, number one, you're obeying the Lord. Number two, you're learning in the double way. Number three, you are bearing fruit in the kingdom of God. You are winning souls into the kingdom. In Matthew chapter 28, Matthew chapter 28, I'm reading from verse 18. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore. The Lord is telling you, don't just stay at the Bible study. Don't sleep in the church. Don't just stay all your life in the church. Come on Monday like this, learn. And then you go. You come to study and then you go to share. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. I have taught you, I planted this word in your heart, now you go to teach other people whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you all the way, even unto the end of the world. And the whole church said, Amen. Amen. Number seven is to train others. To train others. And that's going beyond just teaching them, you are training them. And then you're organizing them, you're mobilizing them, and you're taking them out to go and evangelize. Oh, you say, but I'm not a worker. And why can't you take your friend and then take maybe members of your family and believers, you know, come together. Maybe three of you, four of you, or just five of you, or maybe a larger number. And say, this time, we're going out to our neighborhood. We're going to share the word of God there. We're going to tell. We're going to testify. We're going to talk. We're going to teach. We're going to help other people to know this word of God that we have known. Second Timothy chapter 2. In Second Timothy chapter 2, reading from verse 2. And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses... What does that mean? Uh, those of you are in the front, can you look at your back, please? Please look at the back. Do you see all those people there? Uh-huh. Look, look, look at me now. Uh, that's, that's, I'm reading verse 2 to you now. The things that thou hast heard among many witnesses. You're not alone. Other people, many witnesses you have heard. And among all these people you have learned from, all the things you hear, not just a part of it. You see this verse, and the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses. That's why I told you to look back, to see the many witnesses that are learning along with you, that you are not alone, that you will take what you have learned 
among these many witnesses, the same you will commit to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. I'm not the only teacher. I am teacher number one. I pass it to you. You become the second, uh, the second teacher. You pass it to the other people. They become the third. He passes to other people, becomes the fourth. And then there's the law, a principle of multiplication of teachers. Multiplication of the word of God in the lives of the people. Therefore, you go and train others. You remember what we're talking about? The Lord Jesus is teaching us, number one, that we may be transformed. Number two, that we may tell others. Number three, that we may testify to others. Number four, that we may talk to others. Just talk Bible. Just talk Bible. Not gossip. Just Bible. The gospel, the good news, the word of salvation. And then, number five, turn them. Turn them away from their sin and turn them to the Lord. Then, number six is to teach them. Number seven is to train them. Tonight, the Lord is continuing the teaching again. And we divide the teaching tonight to three parts. It's there on your outline. Number one, the great passion of the thirsty. The great passion of the thirsty. And then number two is God's promise to the thirsty. God's promise to the thirsty. Number three, gracious provision for the thirsty. Let's come back to number one. The great passion of the thirsty. And let's come to Matthew chapter five, verse six. Matthew chapter five, verse six. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. It talks about hunger and thirst. Blessed are they who are hungry and they are thirsty after righteousness. When we talk about hunger, hunger and thirst in the natural are strong desires. They are compelling desires. And they are indicative desires too. Because those are the desires that show that we're still alive. You know, if somebody loses appetite, doesn't want to eat. You see, something is happening here. There is a part of him that is dead. There's a part of him that doesn't have any feeling. You see, when you are really alive and you are active, and then you also exercise yourself, you get hungry and you get thirsty as well. And it is when you are thirsty like that, we know that you are really alive. The same thing spiritually, true spiritual yearning, thirst, desire for God's righteousness will move a believer into action. Action of pursuit. Action of passion. Action of prayer. Your heart will be longing after. In fact, when somebody becomes thirsty, look at the reaction. And look at the passion. Judges chapter 15. In Judges chapter 15, verses 18 and 19. Judges chapter 15, verse 18. 15, 18. And he was so athirst and called on the Lord and said, Thou hast given this great deliverance into the hands of thy servant. And now shall I die for thirst and fall into the hand of the uncircumcised. But God cleave and hollow place that was in the jaw. And there came water thereout. And when he had drunk, his spirit came again and he was revived. The spirit came again and he was revived. Here is something. God had given him a great victory. And even the great victory amounted to nothing because thirst came. That's how it happens to us. When you are really thirsty, you forget every other thing around you. And that's what the Lord is saying. Whatever your position in life, if you want to be in fellowship with God, you must thirst after righteousness. 
And all the position you have in life, all the wealth you have in life, everything you have in life will amount to nothing. When you are really thirsty, you want the Lord to actually quench that thirst. In fact, it affects even your subconscious. Let me show you what I mean by that. In Isaiah chapter 29, Isaiah chapter 29, verse 8. Isaiah 29, reading from verse 8. It shall even be as when an hungry man dreameth, and behold, he eateth, but he awaketh, and his soul is empty. You see what he's saying here? When you are really desirous of something, I'm sure you've experienced that in your life before. It may be that you are thinking so much about marriage. I want to get married. I want to get married. I want to get married. And guess the only kind of dream you have, dreams about marriage. Or if you're thirsty so about having children, I must have a child. I must have a child. I must have a child. You wake up in the morning, you are thinking, I need a child. And then in the night you want to sleep, I must have a child. Guess what you're going to dream about? Having children. Or I want to pass my exam. This exam has been a real, a real son in my flesh. I must pass this exam. That's your thirst. That's your hunger. And that's your desire. That's your passion. And when you sleep at night, uh, think of, uh, guess what you're going to dream about? About, uh, about passing exam. I must travel overseas. My friend is there. My partner is there. So and so is there. I must travel overseas. I must be in that overseas country. And guess what you are dreaming about? About traveling over there. Why? Because of your desire. Number one, that shows us something. You know there are people that say, if you are dreaming about something, it means you have an evil spirit. There's nothing like that. It's just deception, deceiving the people that are ignorant. And then they tell you that if you eat in the dream, uh -huh, there you are. When you wake up, go for deliverance because if you are eating in the dream and you are drinking in the dream, that means you have a demon. Have you heard that before? Uh, do you believe that? Do you accept you have a demon? I don't have a demon. I don't know about you. It, look at that again in, in uh, that Isaiah chapter 29 verse 8. It says, and it shall even be as when an hungry man dreameth, and behold, he eateth, and he wakeneth, and his soul is empty. Nothing has happened to him. It doesn't have to be demon. It's because of the thirst, because of the hunger. That's why he's dreaming like that. Look at the second part of the verse. Or as when a thirsty man dreameth, and behold, he drinketh, and but he awakeneth, and behold, he is faint, and his soul has appetite. Because you need the reality of the drink before the hunger or the thirst can be satisfied. But the thing is this, when there's a great passion, a great desire, you are really longing, you say, Lord, this is what I want. And it's going to make you to take action, to do something. Look at Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15. I'm reading from verse 17. Luke chapter 15. Verse 17, and when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father's are bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father. If you really desire something, it will push you into action. Passion will result in pursuit. You will want to pursue that thing that you are really hungry for. You know, there are people who are in the church and they never have any desire to evangelize, to go out. And they are not thirsty. Thirsty for souls. They are not thirsty. And they are not thirsty for having fruit in Christ and fruit of their relationship with the Lord. And they say, well, I don't know. Uh, the people never come to me. If they come to me, I will witness to them. But they never come. You have thirst. And it is that thirst, that desire, that will give you passion. And the passion will lead to pursuit. You'll pursue what you are thirsty for. You know, there are people sometimes, uh, uh, they come to see me maybe for counseling. And I say, since when have you been in the church? Oh, they will say, I've been in the church now, 19, such and such, about 15 years. Oh, I said, wonderful. What are you doing in the church? 
Oh, then they will smile instead of crying. They will smile and say, I, I'm doing nothing. I say, but why? Oh, it says, uh, Pastor, I don't know, but I enjoy the church. I'm a member of the church. I love the church. And, you know, I never miss any program and any meeting. You don't have any passion, no hunger, no pursuit. And the passion never drives you to pursue serving the Lord. You see, it's the matter of hunger. When you are really hungry, you want to do what you are hungry for. That's why there's a young man here in the parable of the Lord Jesus Christ that he gave. Of the prodigal son. He says, I perish with hunger in this place. I will arise and go unto my father and I will say unto him, Father, I have sinned and against heaven and against thee in verse 20 and he arose and he came to his father that's a hunger that's a thirst because of the hunger he arose and then he went that's what the lord is expecting if you are really hungry after god desirous to have righteousness that the lord jesus christ provided for us on the cross of calvary you'll pursue that righteousness i come to uh, psalm 42 in Psalm 42, we're looking at verses 1 and 2. Psalm 42, verses 1 and 2. As they had panted after the water brooks, so panted my soul after thee, O God. As the as the had panted, having passion, pursuing. The water brooks running over to the water brooks so my soul is panting after you oh god my soul thirsted thirsted for god for the living god when shall i come and appear before god that's passion that's passion and that's what the lord wants you and i to have in i in psalm 63 psalm 63 verses 1 and 8 oh god thou art my god Early will I seek thee, my soul thirsted for thee, my flesh longeth for thee in a dry and thirsty land where no water is. Verse 8, my soul followeth hard after thee, thy right hand upholdeth me. Hey, that's the passion the Lord is expecting that you will have. And if you have that passion, the assurance of the Lord is blessed a day that thirst and hunger after righteousness it says they shall be filled psalm 143 in psalm 143 reading from verse 4 143 verse 4 therefore is my spirit overwhelmed within me my heart within me is desolate i remember the days of old i meditate on all thy works and muse on the work of thy hands. I stretch forth my hands unto thee. My soul thirsteth after thee as a thirsty land. Uh, you know what we're told in those uh, verses I just read to you now? Uh, the thing is this. There are people that say, I want to be thirsty for the things of God. I'm not just thirsty. I want to be hungry for the things of God. I'm not just hungry. I want to be thirsty after righteousness, but I am not. And you say, how can I be thirsty? Before I answer that question in the, in the spiritual, let me bring you to the uh, natural. Let's say, for example, uh, you find that uh, you are going through uh, many days, you, you are not thirsty, you are not drinking water. And uh, those who study about her physiology, about her body, they will tell you that drinking water is very important. In fact, they say you drink a lot of glasses of water every day. It will help your system. But you just discover that you are not thirsty and you are not taking water. What do you do? To make yourself thirsty so that you'll be able to take water. Well, if you take salted nuts and you eat that, you'll be thirsty. If you take biscuit that has some salt, you're going to be thirsty. If you take food that has some salt in it, you're going to be thirsty. You see, you make yourself get thirsty because you know you need the water. And now spiritually, you are not thirsty. You are just there. You are a so-so Christian. And you are a kind of lukewarm Christian. And you are just a normal, average, church-going 
benchwarming Christian. To pray, no thirst, no passion, no desire. To evangelize, no passion, no thirst, no desire. To go from this level of righteousness and go to a higher level of righteousness, no thirst, no desire, no passion. And when you see other people, they are passionate, they are thirsty, they are running after the things of God. They want to be full of righteousness. Say, what's the matter? I'm not like that. And I don't want to pretend. You will not pretend, but look at verse 4. Therefore is my spirit overwhelmed within me. My heart within me is desolate. Begin to compare your life, your spiritual life, with the lives of other people who have read about in the Bible. Pick the life of Enoch, the life of Moses, the life of Elijah, the life of Elisha, the life of John the Beloved, the life of Paul the Apostle, the life of Stephen, the life of Philip. Look at their lives and compare their lives with your life and see how desolate you are. Then pick some converts of yours, the people that you brought to know the Lord and see how they know the Bible now, how they pray and consider their lives and you feel your desolation and see your colleagues. The people you came to the church, maybe at the same time, got saved at the same time, baptized in water at the same time. See how they are running and see what they are doing. There you are. You are not doing anything. And your colleague is already a region overseer. And your colleague is preaching at the, at the Congress. And then as you look at him, you say, eh, that fellow there, well, we're actually colleagues. I remember we were baptized in water the same year, the same day. And I know that other fellow, in fact, he was in my house fellowship. Now he is now a coordinator. And here I am. When you really sit down and you compare those people with yourself, you see your desolation, it, you'll begin to have some passion, some thirst, and some desire. Look at verse 5. I remember the days of old. And that's how we have thirst. You just sit down. You see, in the good old days, when, we, when revival broke out, and before the Thursday revival time, I will go here and invite that person. I will go there and invite that person. I will talk to my boss. I will talk to my, uh, you know, co-workers. I'll talk to my subordinates. When you meditate of the days of old, and then you say, the way I used to be, and the way I used to think, and if I was late for the Bible study like this, the way I will run. When you meditate on the things of old, you'll have passion, you have desire. And not only that, when you think about, maybe you had preached before, you had witnessed before, you remember when you knocked on doors and somebody said, no, don't come to me. I don't want to hear you. I don't want this born again, born again. I don't want to, don't come here again. Then you remember how you went there again. And then eventually the fellow was broken down. And then he said, okay, what do you have to say? While you were talking like this, he was trembling. Maybe he was weeping. He knelt down and then he prayed through to salvation. And you were very, very happy. When you remember the days of old, you begin to have passion and thirst and desire. Or maybe you had preached before. You know, where are they retreat? Maybe in your region. Maybe in your state. Maybe over here at the headquarters. And then we give you a message. And then you preach uh, for that message. And then you preach. After preaching like this, people went on their knees and they prayed. It was difficult for us to stop them praying. But now you are not preaching anymore. You are just like that lukewarm and cold and warming the bench and coming to... You have not backsliding. You are still a child of God. You are not committing literal sin. Only that you are cold. But now you want to wake up. You will remember the days of old. And if you have the cassette at home... That is the case said to preach at that time. You kept it somewhere. Bring it out. And listen to yourself again and say, Was I the one that preached that? I remember that retreat now. I remember that local crusade now. Where you preach this message. Then it will bring fire back into your heart. That's how we have thirst. That's how we have the passion. That's how we have the desire. That's why it says in that verse 5, I remember the days of old. I meditate on all thy works. Have you prayed for the sick before? You remember when your faith was very, very high and somebody was sick around you and he said, let us go to the church. Let us go and see the pastor. And the fellow was really panting, you, you see. Before we get to the pastor, this fellow may give up. All of a sudden, faith rose up in your heart and then you laid your hands on him on how you said, in the name of Jesus. And within five minutes, the fellow got well. 
But since you prayed that prayer, when last did you pray that prayer again? You meditate on the works of God of all time. What God did through you. As you meditate on that and say, but why am I sitting like that now? Why am I just like this? It will bring thirst and hunger in your heart to do something. And then, uh, you know, members of the choir, you remember, uh, you know, I remember those good old days. So, you know, you come up like this and then you sing. And then the people, you know, now they sometimes will sing and they clap. Well, when they are happy, they clap. But, you know, at that time, they may not clap. You find somebody weeping there, somebody weeping there, somebody broken down there. I remember in Lagos here, Jesus 78. I'll never forget. And then we brought all those duets together. And then they will sing like this. As they're singing, the people already, they are getting converted. And they're saying, Lord, I will never leave you. And, you know, members of choir here, those of you are old, you, you remember, salvation is full. I'm free. I, I can even sing it now. I don't want to do that. But you see, when you sang that, those good old days, how the people were broken down. It is when you bring back the memory of what God used you to do in the good old days, then you'll say, now I'm having thirst. I'm having hunger. Those things are going to be repeated again. They'll come again in Jesus' name. Amen. That's why it says, I meditate on all thy works. I muse on the works of thy hand. I stretch forth my hands unto thee. It is that thirst, that passion that makes us now to stretch forth our hand unto the Lord. And it says, my soul thirsteth after thee as a thirsty land. That word there, sailor, means pause, think, slow down, and think about what you have learned. The passion we're talking about is the passion of the thirsty. Number one, it's an individual desire. I cannot get hungry for you. You cannot get thirsty for me. It is an individual desire. Number two, it's an internal desire. It's not something that is written on our forehead. It's not external. It is internal. And how many of you know that internal pain is harder to bear than external pain? It is an internal desire. Number three, if you don't eat immediately when you are hungry, if you don't drink immediately when you are thirsty, it becomes an intense desire. Number four, it becomes an increasing desire. Number five, an incomparable desire. Number six, an interminable desire. And then number seven, instructive influential desire. That's the kind of desire the Lord wants us to have. And he says, blessed are those people that have such desire. He says, they shall be filled. Let us come now to point number two. Point number two, God's promise to the thirsty. God's promise to the thirsty. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 6. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness for they shall be filled i'm so happy about the tense there it says they do hunger and thirst uh, suppose i wasn't thirsty yesterday and i'm thirsty today no big deal no punishment because although i wasn't thirsty yesterday yesterday is gone i miss that chance but today, I am thirsty. That's what God is looking at. Blessed are those who presently do thirst. Who presently do hunger after righteousness. And you know what, what bothers us sometimes? We waste a lot of time concerning yesterday and concerning tomorrow. And we do not live today. Oh, we say, praise the Lord. As for today, really I'm thirsty. But what bothers me is that yesterday I wasn't thirsty, but yesterday is gone. Whatever happened yesterday, whatever mistake of yesterday, what can I do about it? All you can do about it is to go to God. Lord, I am sorry. I wasn't thirsty yesterday. I wasn't hungry yesterday. But yesterday is gone. Please forgive me and I'm forgiven. And then tomorrow, don't worry about tomorrow. You see what bothers many people? They worry about yesterday. They worry about tomorrow. And they are not concerned about today. The Lord says, forget the past. Leave it in the hands of God. Let him forgive you. Don't worry about tomorrow. Leave that in the hands of God to you. But today, blessed are they who thirst presently, who hunger presently, for they shall be filled. I'm sure you are thirsty. And the Lord will fill you. He tells us, we're looking at the promise of God in Isaiah chapter 44. Isaiah chapter 44. I'm reading from verse 3. Isaiah 44 verse 3. 
For I will pour water upon him that is thirsty, and floods upon the dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon thy seed, and my blessing upon thy offspring. And let's notice there it says, I will pour water upon him that is thirsty. Thirsty. Now, it's, it's different when it says, I will give water. That's just a small amount. I will drop water. Just a trickle. That's a little thing. But now I will pour. I will pour. An outpouring. That's why it says, Blessed are they that thirst and hunger after righteousness, for they shall be filled. That's a deluge. That's a flood. That's why it says, I will pour. Pour water upon him that is thirsty. In um, Isaiah chapter 41, verse 17. Isaiah 41, verse 17. When the poor and needy seek water, and there is none, and their tongue faileth for thirst, I, the Lord, will hear them. I, the God of Israel, will not forsake them. I will open rivers in high places, and uh, fountains in the midst of the valleys. I will make the wilderness a pool of water, and dry land springs of water. Uh, can you see here, uh, normally, if you, if you think about this, because it, it talks about wilderness, I will make the wilderness a pool of water, a wilderness. Can you just imagine now in your mind, here is a wilderness. What's a wilderness? That's a desert. That's a dry place. If you take a cup of water and you pour it on a desert land, everything will just sink into the, into the land because it's a desert. It's a wilderness. There will be no pool of water. It is when you take water that almost does not have measure. So much that you pour it and pour it and pour it in a desert, you are going to have a pool. What did Jesus say? He said, blessed are they that do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Which means that the righteousness is talking about is not just a kind of little righteousness that you cannot see. Listen, if you have a desert place, if you have a wilderness... And then you just put a little cup of water and just pour it down. And the sun is shining. If you come there uh, one hour after that, you'll not see any sign of water. Everything is dried up. But when you pour it and you pour it and the whole ground is soaked and there's a pool. Although the sun is shining, when you come a few days later, you still see the pool there. What the Lord is saying is this. I'm going to fill with righteousness. It's going to be visible righteousness. You see the kind of righteousness we have that is so small and only it's just internal. And only those of us that have it, uh, we, we, yes, I'm righteous, I'm righteous. Although you may not see, you need to understand that it's been dry ground a, lot, a long time. And now that the Lord has made me righteous, you may not see, but I know it's there. It's like the dry ground saying, yes, what has been poured. But this desert place, this is a wilderness. But it says, it's going to be a pool. And the kind of righteousness the Lord is talking about then, it's not just a little bit of righteousness. Let me show you uh, what the Lord is saying. Isaiah chapter 48 verse 8. A pool of righteousness. Rivers of righteousness. Much righteousness, visible righteousness. In Isaiah chapter 48, I'm reading from verse 18. Oh, that thou hast akined to, to my commandments. Then at thy peace being as a river, and thy righteousness as the waves of the sea. That's the promise. Thy righteousness as the waves of the sea. And this is not something you'll say, yes. We think he's righteous by his confession, but we cannot see it. He knows he's righteous, but we don't know. No, a wave of sea. That cannot be hidden. It says your righteousness shall be as the waves of the sea. And look at chapter 45 of Isaiah. Isaiah 45 verse 8. Isaiah 45 verse 8. Drop down, ye heavens, from above, and let the skies pour down righteousness. You see that? It's like when the rain is pouring down, pouring down. It says let the skies pour down righteousness. Let the earth open. And let 
uh, and let them bring forth salvation and let righteousness spring up together. I, the Lord, have created it. Can you picture that in your mind? It's like, it's like at the time of the flood of Noah, the fountains were broken up and therefore water was coming from the, beneath the earth and then the rain was descending. Water was coming from above and God says, I'm going to pour righteousness down from above. I'm going to make righteousness spring up from beneath. Then the, a deluge, a flood of righteousness actually comes to your life. That's what the Lord is saying. It says, blessed are they which do thirst and hunger after righteousness, for they shall be filled. This is righteousness. In Isaiah chapter 61, Isaiah chapter 61, I pray God will do this for you. In Isaiah chapter 61, verse 11, it says, for as the earth bringeth forth her bud. And as the garden causes the things that are sown in it to spring forth, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring forth before all the nations. So the Lord will cause righteousness to spring forth before all the nations. Amos chapter, chapter 5 verse 24. Amos. Amos chapter 5. I'm reading from verse 24. Here it tells us, But let judgment run down as waters, and righteousness as a mighty stream. Righteousness as a mighty stream. Uh, you can now understand the provision of the Lord Jesus Christ as he tells us what kind of righteousness is going to give us. It says, it's going to pour it upon us. I pray it will come. I come to point number three, gracious provision for the thirsty. Gracious provision for the thirsty. We're now back in Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 6. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst. Remember, that's present tense. Not that you were thirsty before, now you stop being thirsty now. That's not good enough. Not that you might be thirsty in the future. It's a present reality. Blessed are they which do thirst and hunger after righteousness. For they shall be filled. And that's the gracious promise of the Lord. We're looking at Matthew chapter 6 verse 33. Matthew 6 verse 33. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Have you ever heard somebody saying, first thing first? You know, you are talking about this and this and this, and you want to kind of scatter his mind, divert his attention, pull him here, pull him there. Oh, says, please hold on. First thing first. Uh, let's do the first thing first, and then after that, the rest will follow. It's like you're in your place of work. And then you say, um, my boss, manager, director, I know we have to do this, we have to do this. It says, wait a minute. You're talking about too many things. Can you put order in them? Show me what's the most important thing. And show me what's the next important thing. And show me what's the thing, well, it's good and important, but it's not urgent. And if we don't do it now, nothing will go bad. And then tell me another thing, you can delegate that. Tell me other thing, you can just eliminate and then you eliminate this and you delegate this and then eventually you come to just the first scene and it says, okay, go back now to your desk and make the main thing the main thing. Don't get scattered here, scattered here. That's what the Lord is saying. He's saying that I might think about many, many things. I want this. I want this. I want this. The Lord is saying first things first. Make the main thing the main thing and the major thing. And he says, seek ye first. The kingdom of God and his righteousness. Be thirsty and be hungry after righteousness. You know, I've discovered something in life. That many times your mind is saying, I need this. I need this. I need this. And then uh, another person is just, I just want to be righteous. I just want to serve the Lord. I want to be my best for God. I want to be at the center of the will of God. If you will compare those two people, this person is looking for healing, is looking for deliverance, is looking for money, is looking for job, is looking for wife. This other fellow, yes, he needs those things, but his mind is not there. He says, just now. 
All I want now is just to be righteous. I just want to know the Lord. I want to love the Lord. I want to serve the Lord. And then you find he becomes righteous. And the things that he's not even praying for, they are just coming. Somebody, they just write a letter to him. Yeah, don't you, why are you just sitting at home? Don't you need a job? And they call him. And then somebody is even taking his name to the marriage committee. Uh, the Lord is revealing to me. And then they call him, you are a man. Are you planning on marriage? Yes, I want to get married. Have you prayed? I'm still praying on righteousness. Well, somebody brought your name. You see, the thing is, when you seek the righteousness of God, and the will of God, you want to be at the very center of what the Lord wants for you. All the things that this fellow is seeking, you get everything before he gets one of them. That's why the Lord is saying, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. It tells us in Psalm 48. Psalm 48. The Lord is saying you come because he has this righteousness in his right hand to give you. In Psalm 48, reading from verse 9, it says, We have thought of thy loving kindness, O God, in the midst of thy temple. According to thy name, O God, so is thy praise unto the ends of the earth. Thy right hand is full of righteousness. That's why we seek the Lord. Because the righteousness is in the right hand of the Lord. Psalm 118. Psalm 118. Verses 19 all through to 21. 19 to 21. It tells us, open to me the gates of righteousness. And I will go in into them and i will praise the lord this gate of the lord into which the righteous shall enter i will praise thee for thou hast for thou hast heard me and I art become my salvation the lord is telling us that he wants us to be full of righteousness and the lord jesus said there's something where to do where to thirst and where to hunger uh, what does that mean? Number one, pursue righteousness. Pursue righteousness. Uh, you are running up tight. You are following hard up tight. You are seeking for it. And you are praying for it. Pursue righteousness. First Timothy chapter 6. First Timothy chapter 6. Reading from verse 11. First Timothy 6 verse 11. But thou, O man of God... Thou, O woman of God, thou, O minister of God, thou, O child of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness. Pursue it. Pursue righteousness. You wake up in the morning, O Lord, thank you for my salvation. Thank you for your presence in my life. Today, make me, keep me righteous through and through in my thoughts, in my heart, in my life. In everything around me, everything I do, everything I say, Lord, I'm pursuing righteousness. That's my goal. Other people may seek after this and seek after that. My single pursuit is righteousness. Number two, pray for righteousness. Number one, you pursue. Number two, you pray. Hosea chapter 10. Hosea chapter 10. We're reading from verse 12. Hosea 10 verse 12. Sow to yourselves in righteousness. Reap in mercy. Break up your fallow ground. For it is time to seek the Lord till he come and rain righteousness upon you. When you pray, don't be satisfied with a little righteousness. And you know, praise the Lord. You know, somebody asked me a question today and I, just, I didn't have to think. I just told him the truth. That's great. But don't stop praying for righteousness yet. Until there's a rain of righteousness poured upon you, affecting your attitude, affecting your mind, affecting your heart, affecting your action, affecting your relationship, affecting your feeling, affecting everywhere. Until it comes to rain righteousness upon you. Pray for righteousness. Number three, possess righteousness. Possess it. Possess it. Make sure that the Lord gives it to you. It's a gift of God. It's available for everyone. Possess righteousness. In Titus chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. Titus chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared unto all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly laws, we should live soberly, righteously, 
godly and godly in this present world possess righteousness. In Luke chapter 1, let me show you an example of a family that adds righteousness, possess righteousness. In Luke chapter 1, reading from verse 5, there was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zechariah of the cause of Abiah, and his wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and, um, and, uh, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God. They were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and the ordinances of the Lord, blameless. They possessed it. We can possess it too. Number four, practice righteousness. You know, there will be no point saying we possess something if we cannot practice it, we cannot live it out. That will be useless. But you practice righteousness. In First John chapter 2, First John chapter 2, reading from verse 29, First John chapter 2 verse 29, If ye know that he is righteous, ye know that everyone that doeth righteousness is born of him that doeth righteousness. Again, in the present tense, not that he did it, he's not doing it anymore, not that he's hoping to do righteousness in the future, right now, at this present time, in mind, in thought, in life, in action, he practices, he doeth righteousness. Chapter 3, verse 7. In chapter 3 of 1 John, verse 7, little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. But say he that committeth sin is of the devil. That he see that is not practicing righteousness. Maybe just saying it with the word of mouth. I'm righteous to you. And the righteousness of God, Christ is my righteousness, but he's not practicing it. It says, he that committeth sin is of the devil. For the devil sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whosoever is born of God does not commit sin. For a seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. Verse 10 in this the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil, whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. So then, number one, pursue righteousness. Number two, pray for righteousness. Number three, possess righteousness. Number four, practice righteousness. Number five, protect righteousness. Protect righteousness. In your own family, protect righteousness. In your local church, protect righteousness. In the church at large, protect righteousness. Uh, you love righteousness. You practice righteousness. You delight in righteousness. You want other people to also be righteous. And then somebody comes and is bringing an unrighteous act, an unrighteous attitude, an unrighteous behavior, an unrighteous influence. He wants to influence other people to be unrighteous. You are to protect righteousness. Psalm 106. In Psalm 106, reading from verse 28. Psalm 106, verse 28. They joined themselves also unto be out pure and ate the sacrifices of the dead. Thus they provoked him to anger with their inventions and the plague break in upon them then stood up Phinehas and executed judgment and so the plague was stayed what happened is this the children of Israel were coming from Egypt and they were going to the land of Canaan and uh, Balak called Balaam to come and curse the children of Israel but Balaam, although he went, he couldn't do it. God turned all the curse into blessing. And then Balak said, I called you to curse my enemies. And you have blessed them all this time. Didn't I tell you I cannot go beyond the word of the Lord? Or I'd go your way. 
the Lord has prevented you from having all the reward I wanted to give you. And then Balaam thought, Balaam thought about it. What will I do? I still want the money from Balak. Oh, he said, I know what you can do, Balak. If I give you counsel, then you give me the reward when you defeat them. If you will make them commit sin, well, the ladies of uh, Moab, then God will forsake them. That's exactly the principle of pollution, of immorality that Balak employed. And then the people joined themselves to so the women. And then they also worshipped their idols. God became angry. And the plague broke out. And while the Moses came to the people, see what you have done. And see the destruction that has come because of the sin that you have committed. Then there was a disrespectful man and then a woman. And they were holding themselves, wanting to commit humility. And then Phinehas took a javelin and then threw it at them and killed both of them. And then God said, because of what Phinehas has done visiting judgment upon the people that are spreading and, uh, and they're propagating sin because of what he has done i stop my anger that's what he's saying here look at that verse 20 30 again then took stood up Phinehas and executed judgment and so the plague was stayed the plague ceased the plague stopped look at the comment in verse 31 and that was counted unto him for righteousness unto all generations forevermore that judgment that stopped the plague became righteousness for him what's the meaning of that the meaning is this that already you have prayed for righteousness you possess righteousness you practice righteousness you love righteousness and you uh, you associate with other people also righteous in the lord and there here comes somebody in your locality here comes somebody in your section over there here comes somebody in your house fellowship here comes somebody among the workers or among the members and then it begins to openly openly defend sin openly practice sin openly recommend sin, openly influence other people to sin, that this righteousness that is so precious to us now, that by the grace of God, we are possessing now, and we're practicing now, he wants to make jest of everything, ridicule everything, and then put everything in the mud again, and influence other people to come back to square one, or to square zero, or to square minus hundred, getting us back in the old days when we didn't know the Lord. And then you report the matter. You dissociate from the person. You judge the person. You condemn that action. And then you separate. Say, no, I'm not part of that. I'm not going to befriend you because of this. In fact, I'm going to report you. And if you have authority and power like a leader, you stop them from doing whatever they are doing. And God says, that is righteousness on your behalf because you are protecting righteousness now number six is to preserve preserve righteousness isaiah in isaiah chapter 32 isaiah chapter 32 i'm reading from verse 15 until the spirit be poured upon us from on high and the wilderness be a fruitful field, and the fruitful field be counted for a forest. Then judgment shall dwell in the wilderness, and righteousness remain. Righteousness remain in the fruitful field. You preserve it. You preserve it. It goes from you. Thank God you are married, and your wife also is righteous. The husband also is righteous. We pass it on to the children, and righteousness remains in our family. And our children, we don't allow them to bring in any sin, any pollution, any immorality, anything defiling. Righteousness remains in the family. And then in that local church, as God has helped us, our leaders are sanctified and holy and righteous. Our, you know, workers, all of us, by the grace of God, we plunge into the grace of God. We're righteous and holy and saintly and sanctified. And then we're passing it on to our new converts, and righteousness is there. And then the preacher, he doesn't preach only, but righteousness once in a year he preaches it over and over and over to make us keep conscious of that righteousness the righteousness coming through the grace of god and we're having testimonies praise the lord my brother you know our testimonies are changing and we say you know if somebody wanted to get me to temptation but the lord gave me grace and preserved and protected me and i said no way i cannot do that anymore i've graduated away from that another person is giving testimony praise the lord the 
fix I used to fall into, I'm not falling into it anymore, and we're all rejoicing. And then the righteousness is flowing like a river in our midst, and the righteousness remains in the church of God. You preserve righteousness. Number seven, preach righteousness. Preach righteousness. The Lord makes you to receive and then to go and give it out. You are taught and then you go and teach other people. You preach righteousness. In 2 Peter chapter 2, 2 Peter chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 5. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 5. And spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness. A preacher of righteousness. That is who God has made you, and you'll be a preacher of righteousness. In Daniel chapter 3, here is your reward. The Lord will reward you here on earth. He'll reward you when you get to heaven. In Daniel chapter 12, verse 3. And they that the wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness, as the stars forever and ever. You see what the Lord has done for you, and what the Lord still wants to do in your heart. It says, blessed are they, we do thirst and hunger after righteousness. Because of that word, you say, now, that's my pursuit. You pursue righteousness. If you are pursuing it, that means you are praying. You say, that is my prayer. And you are praying for that righteousness. And you go to the Lord on bended knee with your heart and with your life. Holding on to the promise of God saying, oh Lord, I want this righteousness. You pursue it. You have passion for it. And then you pray for it. And when you pray, you pray according to the promise of God. Because it is Christ, our righteousness. It is God who is going to rain down. Who is going to pour down that righteousness upon us. And he says, it is time to seek the Lord until he comes and he rains and he pours down that rain of righteousness in your heart, in your soul, in your mind, in your family. And then after that prayer, then he says, you possess it. Before you get up from your prayer, there's an assurance in your heart because it says the Spirit of God bears witness with our heart that we are the children of God. The Spirit of God also bears witness with our heart that that righteousness is now there. In fact, it's like this. Think about it now. You have been very, very thirsty. And then you have been looking for water. You can barely talk because your throat is dry. Your mouth is dry. And then as we're searching here and there, almost fainting, then you got water to drink cool water and the moment you drink it you have the experience you feel it in your mouth am i right you feel it in your throat am i right in fact when it gets to your tummy you even feel it in your tummy you know now my thirst is satisfied that's what the lord is saying when that righteousness comes you'll feel it in your soul you'll feel it in your mind you'll know it in your life you'll know that this is real and you don't want to bargain with anybody, exchange it for anything on earth. You become a possessor of that righteousness. And then you go out, then you say, once I was blind, but now I can see. The things I used to do, I cannot do them anymore. The places I used to go, I cannot go there anymore. The relationship I used to have, I cannot have them anymore. It's, you, you don't even want to. It's against your mind now. It's against your will now. It's against your heart now. The things you will do before and laugh about it. The things you will do before and just, you know, just snob by other people and say, what are you talking about? Am I the only one? Today, your mind is not even in that thing anymore. Righteousness fills your heart. Righteousness fills your soul. You practice righteousness. You come to your place of work like this. Maybe you're a lady. And then, you know, the boss uh, you will normally come before carelessly and party you at the back you know the way you even look and you know the way you look at the man like a funny like strange and say excuse me sir i i don't want that kind of thing again things are different now and then you begin to witness to him and then you see that things have totally really changed because now you practice that righteousness and you protect righteousness you, you have holy indignation against sin you see sin anywhere you know the things will excuse, excuse before well they are young people you know, it's just a new convert. Or maybe that's his weak area. Or, well, that's his, uh, you know, his uh, idiosyncrasy. That's his eccentricity. That's what he likes to do. The things you excuse before, you cannot excuse them anymore. Because now you protect righteousness. And there's one single motive you have. You say, as long as I'm in this church, 
I'm going to preserve righteousness. As long as I'm in this house fellowship, as long as I'm in this district, as long as I'm in this community, they are not going to be able to do anything that is against righteousness. I'll frown at it. I'll speak up against it. I'll fight against it. I will contend for the faith once delivered unto the saints. You preserve righteousness and you become a preacher of righteousness. And it's tonight you are starting. It's tonight you are starting. As we're going back home, even with somebody who came to the Bible study, yes, he is righteous and you are righteous. Show me two righteous people talking together. What are they talking about? They're talking about righteousness. Show me two people that have, you know, this woman has just got a child. This woman has just got a child. And then they come together. What are they talking about? They're talking about having children. Show me about two rich people. This one is rich and this one is rich. And they come together. What are they talking about? They're talking about wealth and riches. Is show me about somebody he wants to travel to America this one wants to travel to America and then they meet together what are they talking about they're talking about traveling to America show me two people who are righteous the brother there the sister there and then they're going back home after the Bible study he is righteous and she is righteous Show me what they are talking about. They are talking about righteousness. Righteousness, they are righteous. Righteousness in the whole congregation. And then you get back home, you take righteousness back home. And righteousness will fill this land. When you become preachers of righteousness, we are starting tonight. I said we are starting tonight. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer. The Lord has spoken to us. The Lord himself will bring the righteousness. Blessed are they, blessed are they which do thirst and hunger at righteousness, for they shall be filled. You can pursue it from tonight. You can pursue it from tonight. You can seek the face of the Lord from tonight and pray until that righteousness fills you and saturates you. That's the promise of the Lord, and that's the provision of Christ. Blessed. 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 Are those who do thirst and they hunger at a righteousness, for they shall be filled. Pursue it. Make this your single pursuit in life. You want it. You desire it. You love it. You reject all unrighteousness. Unrighteousness in conversation. Unrighteousness in interaction. Unrighteousness in behavior, unrighteousness in attitude, reject it. Unrighteousness in emulating, copying other people, reject it. Thirst and hunger is a personal, individual matter. You are hungry, I know. You are thirsty, I know. Tell the Lord. Lord, I am hungry. Lord, I am thirsty. More righteousness. More holiness give me. Pursue righteousness. Pray for it. Pray for it. It is time to seek the Lord until he comes and he raises righteousness upon you. Let it be a rain of righteousness, a flood of righteousness, pouring it on you, in your soul, in your mind, in your heart, in your spirit, in your behavior, in your family, in your interaction, in everything, in your attitude. Pour righteousness upon you. He'll do it. Pray until it's done. Pray with faith. First thing first, 
Make the main scene the main scene. Pray until you possess. Possess righteousness. It's for you. The promise is for you. Possess. Possess. Make up your mind, you'll go out of here and go and practice. You'll not practice righteousness anymore in the private or in the public. When you are alone, when you are with other people, righteousness will be the principle of your life. Practice it. Protect it. Don't protect your friend in unrighteousness. Protect righteousness. Protect righteousness. Any tendency you see is going to bring unrighteousness, deal with it. Any relationship that is trying to promote unrighteousness, check it. Any conversation that is going to result in unrighteousness, you check it and stop it. Any behavior that is going to influence other people into unrighteousness, you deal with it. Protect righteousness. Any habit of yours that is going to discourage people from being righteous through and through, cut off that habit. Pray and overcome that habit. Protect righteousness. Any worker, any member that will live deliberately in unrighteousness, remember one bad egg will spoil many other eggs. One rotting egg will spoil many others. Deal with that unrighteous fellow. Protect righteousness in the church, in the ministry, in the fellowship. No favoritism. No tribalism. No sectionalism. Protect righteousness. Preserve it. Preserve it. Preserve it. Preach it. The Lord has brought you here and he has taught you so you can be transformed. That's what the Lord is doing right now. Lord, you are transforming me. Lord, you are transforming me. So that his glory and his beauty and his goodness can be seen in your life. Let him transform you through and through. Lord, you are transforming me. As the Lord transforms you, go and tell others. Tell others of the salvation of the Lord. Go and testify to others that Jesus is Savior. 
go and testify to others. The Lord has saved you. You can save them too. Lead them to repentance. Go and talk to others. This is the only thing to talk about. How the righteous sinner can be a righteous believer in Christ. Talk to them. Turn them around. Turn them from sin to the Savior. Turn them to the Lord. Teach them the way of the Lord, the way of salvation. Teach them. Teach them. Teach them. The people God brings across your way. Teach them the way of righteousness. And if you happen to be a leader in the church, train others. You know how to preach, train others to preach. You know how to evangelize, train others to evangelize. You know how to encourage other people to seek the Lord, train other people to also seek the Lord, to know how they can lead others to seek the Lord. Then your blessing will not have any limit or any measure. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst at righteousness, for they shall be filled.